I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So the common thoughts and the common mind frames amongst the people in Corinth became a part of the thinking of the church as well. One of these common thoughts was the idea of dualism. I know dualism, it sounds like a funny word. I know you hear dual and you're thinking two cowboys and they pace ten steps and turn around, bang. That's not the dual we're talking about. Dualism, simply defined, is a way of thinking. Dualism is the teaching that everything natural is evil and everything spiritual is good. This was a common thought amongst the Corinthian people. So if you see that term, again, we're going to use it quite frequently. If you see dualism, again, then you'll know exactly what we're talking about. But as I was saying, the religious institutions that were there during Paul's time, two of which happened to be the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And for the topic of this conversation, we're going to focus on the Sadducees and their belief. You see, the Sadducees were a religious order of people that did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in life eternal. They did not believe in eternal reward. So their thoughts and their beliefs fit kind of nicely along with the common pagan dualistic way of thinking during Paul's time. Because where you had the Pharisees who kind of degraded spiritual truths into how we live this life here and now, and the people who believed in dualism, they came together to form this way of thinking that stressed living this super spiritual life and at the same time negated the importance of a resurrection and denied the importance of life everlasting. And if we've spent any time in church, I'm quite sure we've heard of these two groups of people. We've heard the term Pharisee and Sadducee. So what is the difference between a Pharisee and Sadducee? I just want to clear this up before we get started, and it's a pretty deep explanation, so put your thinking caps on for just one second, and I'm going to explain briefly the major difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee. You see, the major difference between the Pharisee and the Sadducee was this. The Pharisee believed in the afterlife. The Sadducee didn't. That's why he was sad, you see. <laughs> all right, all right. That probably would have worked a little better if I had a drummer give me the boom, boom, boom thing. Probably would have worked a little better. But in all seriousness, these are some of the things that Paul had to deal with during his time. These are some of the things that the early church had to deal with during the writing of the Apostles' Creed. And in our culture today, what we deal with here and now is this idea presented in pop culture of a zombie Jesus. You see the popular uh, uh, fad and the, and the craze of zombieism and zombies movies like The Walking Dead and the numerous zombie titles that have come out in the theater has kind of grown this obsession amongst the, the youngsters and amongst the popular culture has grown this obsession in zombieism and the common culture has taken this idea and this interest in zombies and kind of used it to attack the church. Because if you Google just the term zombie Jesus, you're going to get over 3.5 million, three and a half million results. So if you have your tablet or your smartphone or anything, I dare you just to Google the term zombie Jesus. You're going to get over three and a half million hits on the term zombie Jesus. And over 225,000 of those hits are from a phrase referring to Jesus as the cosmic Jewish zombie. And so not only is that offensive to an entire culture of, culture of people, but that's offensive to our 
beliefs and our belief systems and what we hold dear. So you can see how this notion of zombieism affects what people believe in their faith, but more importantly, as we're talking today, it affects people's perception of a resurrection. It affects people's perception of life eternal. But thanks be to God who has given us faith, we can stand in the face of the naysayers and the non-believers and proclaim that I am his child and I believe in a bodily resurrection and in life eternal. If you could, with me, turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. We're going to get started in the 14th verse, 2 Corinthians 4 and 14. Second Corinthians 4 and 14 reads as this, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. And so you see here that Paul paints perfectly a kind of two-sided argument. And he maps it out simply, concisely, and perfectly. You see, the idea or the premise of Paul's entire argument to the Corinthians is that a bodily resurrection is real, that there is a resurrection of the believers. And his premise or his proof behind this argument is that Jesus Christ himself was raised. Because in the wording of that verse, Paul says, we will be raised with Christ. And so the common logic there is that if I say, I'm going to McDonald's with Brad, well, that lets you know that, one, I'm going to McDonald's, but I'm not going to be the only one going. There's going to be someone with me because I said I'm going with Brad. So if the Apostle Paul says, we will be raised with Christ, that lets you know that Jesus was raised himself. But not only him, not only was he raised, but we will be raised as well. And so you, he paints this, this dualistic kind of two-sided argument, one side supporting the other, that if you believe in the resurrection of Christ, then you can believe in the resurrection of the body or of the believers. And if Christ had not been resurrected, then we could not believe in the resurrection of a believer. You see, one side of the argument fits the other. Well, I want you to put a mark there in, in, in 2 Corinthians 4, and I want you to flip over to 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. Mark that verse, and I want you to flip over to 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. So let's read the first few verses of our, of our study today. 1 Corinthians 15 and 12, 12 reads as this. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And so Paul revisits this argument that he makes in 2 Corinthians 4. He revisits this argument and kind of stacks blocks there to kind of give us building blocks and steps into how we can believe and perceive the resurrection of the body. The first couple of verses in our study, once again, they just revisit the truth that Paul so plainly pointed out in 2 Corinthians 4. Jesus' Jesus's resurrection proves that we will be resurrected. And if you look closely at the first verse, Paul says, if it is preached that Christ was resurrected. Well, namely, since it's preached that Christ is resurrected, how, how then do some of you say there's no resurrection. 
And so this gives us a little bit of insight into how the Corinthians thought. Because many of the Corinthian Christians in the church of Corinth did believe that Jesus Christ was resurrected. Or else they couldn't have been Christians. They wouldn't have been followers of Paul, who was then a follower of Jesus. You see, they did believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. But because you had the dualists, you had the pagan thinkers, and you had the Sadducees that constantly pumped this this secular way of thinking, so they kind of reason amongst themselves that, okay, Jesus Christ was raised, but other than that, there'll be no resurrection. Other than Christ's resurrection, we, we won't see a resurrection. You see, because of the dualistic mindset and the, co combined with the, the Sadducees' teaching, the idea of a bodily resurrection was kind of repulsive. To them, it was disgusting. Because as we said earlier, everything natural in their perception was evil. And everything spiritual was good. So this very body was something that was evil, was something that was disgusting, it was something that was disliked. And so if the, if the body died, good riddance in their perception, in their way of thinking. If the body died, well... So sad, see you later. It was, it was a good thing for the body to die because in their mind, they were entering into the spiritual, something great and something grand. But if then you say that this body will be raised up and there's going to be a spirit back in the body again, oh, my word to them that was, don't say that. That's disgusting. But for, for us, the believer, and for Paul, this is not only a reality, but it is a magnificent and godly truth. As we continue, verse 15 says that, moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he has raised Christ, whom he did not raise. If in fact the dead are not raised, if the dead are, are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sin. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ has perished. You see, the resurrection of the believers proves three things. Number one, it authenticates our preaching according to Scripture. Number two, it validates our faith. And three, it guarantees our hope for the future. The reality of the resurrection authenticates our preaching, which Paul plainly states in verse 14. When he says, and if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith also is in vain. Secondly, in 16 and 17, Paul says that without the resurrection, our faith would be worthless. And the word worthless in the, in the Greek is a word that is simply translated as without purpose or empty or void of substance. And so the truth implied there, the truth behind this statement is that Paul says, since Christ was raised from the dead, or Paul implies that since Christ was raised from the dead, that our faith is not worthless. Our faith is not in vain. Our faith, as it is, is the real deal. Because you can see that, that Christ himself was resurrected, which enables us to believe that we ourselves will be resurrected. And so his resurrection authenticates our faith and our beliefs. And you can see it's that belief that gives us reason. Because if he hadn't been risen, we couldn't believe today in a resurrection. We couldn't believe today in life eternal. If Christ had not been risen, we are just here telling a bunch of stories, wasting our time, doing something to do on a Sunday morning. If Christ has not been risen, none of this means absolutely nothing. But the truth that we hold to and the reality is that Christ has been risen and our faith has been authenticated and so has our preaching been given value. And so we understand and we know and we can be confident that our faith is the opposite of illegitimate. Our faith is legitimate. 
It's real. And so I was thinking, and I realized that some time ago, uh, our family ministry, namely the, the men's ministry, went out and attended a Marlins game. So I was just thinking about baseball a little bit, and I noticed a clip. And I want you guys to take a look. And there's a, a few umpires in this clip. Let's see if we can see who's the authentic and the illegitimate umpires. Take a look. Can anybody guess who the fake umpires were? Yeah, I, I thought those were the real ones. I thought the guy standing on the field was the fake one. I was mixed up. No, no, but in seriousness, in all seriousness, those two guys behind the dugout, dressed like umpires, probably with authentic face mask and gear, standing up, making signals, probably the real signals that the, the authentic umpire made, they could stand up and they could wave their hand and they could yell safe or strike or out and they could do whatever they want to do and they could scream to their blue in the face and, and motion all over. But at the end of the day, no one paid attention or at least no one on the field paid attention or cared at all what they did in the stands. Why? Because they were not legitimately a part of the officiating crew of that baseball event. They were not. They were not authentic. And so happens in our life when we just attend a church and we just go through the motions and we say the church words and we dress in the, the church clothes and we walk the church walk and we talk the church talk. We're just like the umpires sitting behind the dugout doing the motions, but none of the calls matter. See, heaven's eyes really aren't aren't looking with any significance on, on your illegitimate motions. If you don't have faith enough to know and to believe and to trust that Jesus Christ raised from the dead gives us the possibility to be raised and resurrected, then we become just like those illegitimate umpires. We become sounding brass, according to Scripture. In verse in verses 16 and 17, Paul makes a point. He says that without, the, without our resurrection, our faith will be worthless. To put it plainly, if you're taking notes, the resurrection does this. It validates our faith. Thirdly, the resurrection guarantees our hope for the future, which is why verse 19 says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men to be most pitied. In this life, if we have hoped in Christ only, then we are of all men to be most pitied. What exactly does that mean? You see, this was a direct reference to kind of the pagan thought and the, 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 the Sadducees' teaching. Because all of their spirituality was based on this life right here. All of their spirituality was for this life. And after this, it was over. It was done. There was nothing. There was sleep. And so Paul says that if our hope was like that, if our hope in spirituality, if our hope in Christ was just for this life only, then we are pretty Pitiful. But not only does Christ and his death and his resurrection give us hope for now, but we can know and we can realize and we can trust that when this life is over, there's more to come. When this show stops, the show ain't over. There's more to come. We can know and we can believe that this life it's just the beginning of a life to come. In verse 20, Paul says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who were asleep. 
Paul says that Christ being raised from the dead is now the first fruit of those who were asleep. Sleep being a euphemism for the natural death. Christ being the first fruit of those raised was speaking in terms that was completely understandable by the people of the time. Because in Bible times, most people were of a gregarian culture, which means that most of them participated in agriculture. Most of them participated in farming. That's how they got their food. That's how they ate. That's how they survived. Most people grew a crop. And so when the winter passed and spring started to roll in, those first few pieces of fruit on the vine or the bush or the tree, those first few pieces of fruit symbolized something for the farmer or for the homeowner. It symbolized a great hope for a future harvest. You see, those first few apples or those, those first few pears that grew out of the tree or grew out of the bush told that farmer that, okay, there's a crop coming. There's a, a reaping, there's a harvesting coming. And so as Christ, when Christ raised from the dead, when God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that showed us as believers that this first fruit, this first happening, Christ being raised from the dead, gives us hope, just as the farmer had hope in seeing the first apple or pear or piece of fruit growing on his tree. We have the hope in seeing Jesus Christ raised from the grave. We have the hope that we will experience the same. And we can trust and we can believe what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, that we will be raised with him. This point is even more thoroughly explained in verses 21 and 22, where Paul says, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of dead. As in Adam all die, so as also in Christ all will be made alive. And so the point there is that Adam led us into death, but Jesus Christ leads us into life. You see, with Adam, we all have a, a natural father. We all have a start of our lineage, and we have all started our bloodline in some way, in some form, whether you're black, white, green, yellow, or purple. We all started with Adam. He can be considered our father in the natural sense. And through Adam, we have inherited these traits. One specific trait, one significant trait that we have inherited from our natural father is sin. But our spiritual father, who came to visit us in the form of Christ Jesus, has a trait that he wants us to develop, and that's holiness. And the only way to attain that is to trust him as Lord and Savior and to invite him into your heart. And so we stream over, we stem from these natural traits, these natural tendencies, the natural trait of sin. Christ causes us to grow and develop this natural or, or supernatural trait of holiness. And it's only through his blood, only through trusting him as Lord and Savior, that we can attain this supernatural trait. What we can learn from this truth is that Adam, who begins our natural heritage, is ultimately responsible for us being led into death. And it is, it is then, once we've accepted Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it is then that we are positioned to put on immortality and life eternal. At the beginning of our discussion today, we hadn't only proclaimed to believe in a resurrection of the body, but also in life eternal. And Paul talks to us regarding this issue, too. And let's skip down a bit and look at verse 50. First Corinthians 15 and 50 says this. Now I say this, brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And nor does the perishable inherit 
the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. You see, the point that Paul is painting to us is the fact that although these bodies that we have now are well suited to live and to walk and to talk and to function where we are now, although these bodies are good for here and now, these bodies don't work in eternity. And it makes me think of two good buddies I have. I have a friend that's a professional beach volleyball player. And I hope to one day see him in the Olympics uh, in this event, in beach, in beach volleyball. He's really good. And I have another friend of mine who's a firefighter. Both guys have hot jobs. Let's just face it. It's really hot. It's sweaty. It's, you know, it's, it's a hot job. You know, both guys have jobs that expose them to heat. Well, they dress differently in those activities. You see, the guy that plays beach volleyball, they have little support tape that they wear in their fingers and wrists and toes and ankles to, to stop sprains and twists and turns, and they wear the mud under the eyes, and they wear plenty of sunscreen, and they have sunglasses, and they wear hats, and they wear tank tops, and they wear trunks. You know, those are all suited for what he's doing. But the firefighter has heavy boots and fire-resistant suit and a helmet with a mask that breathes in and out oxygen and, and gloves just in case he has to touch a hot surface. So could you imagine for a second if the firefighter says, hey, I'm going to suit up and I'm going to go out here and get ready to play beach volleyball. He probably lasts a few minutes before he's out. Or could you imagine if the beach volleyball player said, okay, I'm going to suit up with the things that I wear for what I do, and I'm going to run into this burning building, and I'm going to be a firefighter. Well, if he makes it in, chances are he won't make it out. And if he does make it out, his next stop is going to be the psych ward. And that takes us to our next term, medication. No, no, joking. You see, the point is this, is that even though our bodies now are suited well for where we are now. These bodies aren't built for eternity. So this truth flies in the face of the zombie Jesus attitude or the zombie Jesus pop culture. Because Jesus wasn't a zombie in the sense that we see someone died and decaying and simply the old body, the old dying, the old decaying body just gets up out of the ground and he's still falling apart and still smelly and slimy and disgusting. No, no. Paul proclaims that we will be changed. We will be made brand new. You see, there are no holy zombies. I'm sorry to tell you all, you fans of Walking Dead, but there will not be any holy zombies. You see, we will receive a brand new body. And so what that means for us now is that all of us that have struggled with waking up in the morning and feeling less than 100%, all of us that, that, that struggle with hurting and aches and pains and, and not understanding what's wrong or why it's wrong or what's going on with me, all of us that have seemed to lo lose hope in our physical condition, there is eternal hope that one day you'll be raised with Jesus, you'll be raised with Jesus, and then you'll get a brand new body a body that's suited for eternity. I want to draw your attention once again to verse 52. And this was a verse here that I, that I used the, the New Living Translation because I like the way the New Living words it, and it kind of jumps off of the page. Verse 52 in the New Living says this, For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our dying bodies. You see, currently, whether we're young or old, our bodies are all doing the same thing right now. They're dying. But eventually, according to Scripture, these dying bodies will be removed. And we'll put on bodies 
that will never die. And in these three verses, Paul makes a few unique distinctions. In verse 50, Paul basically notes that our natural bodies will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this statement gives us a deeper look into the resurrection by implying that not only will we be raised or resurrected, but we'll be made brand new. Every believer will receive a new body. In verse 52, Paul lets us know that we will live forever in our new bodies. And this fact proves in our new imperishable forever bodies that our new bodies won't die or decay and those bodies will be eternal. Finally, Paul brings his debate to a close by proclaiming victory in verse 57. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57 reads as this, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't heard anything I've said today, if you haven't understood or grasped anything that I've said so far today, I want you to listen closely and I want you to understand the conclusion of it all. And the bottom line is this, is that if we believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we believe that we will be resurrected from the dead. And if we believe that we will be resurrected from the dead, then there is hope, there is an eternal hope for life everlasting. And that hope gives us victory. What better way to sum it up than Paul? But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. All of this just reminds me of a, of a gentleman I became familiar with in Nashville, and I'll tell you a little bit about him and then I'll finish up. But a guy in Tennessee by the name of Kirby who was an archer, and eventually he became a marksman. And he developed multiple talents with multiple weapons. The guy was a master with a bow and arrow. He was a master with a rifle. And eventually he got to a point where he said, okay, we're going to stem away from the archery. We're going to get into rifles and, and weaponry only. And so in one exposition that he was doing, he, he was known for proclaiming his faith during his expositions. And, and during a show, he would tell everyone about his faith, and, and he would use his natural talent as a tool to share his faith. And so in one exposition, he was shooting classical weapons, and he had a musket. And as he lined up his shot with the musket, and he pulled the trigger, something unthinkable happened. One in a million chance, the hot embers from the powder in the musket blew back into his face. And so those burning powders seeped into his eyes and, and rolled around. And, and the more frantically that he rubbed, the deeper he rubbed this burning powder into his eyes. And he bent over and he clutched in pain for a minute. And then he stood up and he called his assistants over. And he says, hey, guys, hey, guys, I need you to turn the lights on in the range because it's completely dark in here. And they said, well, well Kirby, we're, we're outside. It's not dark. It's daytime. And so they rushed him to the ER. Well, in the ER, the news came to Kirby that the damage to your cornea and retina by that hot gunpowder is irreversible. There's nothing we can do. It is what it is. And so this man who once made a living off of what he could see and how he could line up a shot could barely see his hand in front of his face. This guy who once had eyes full of life and vibrance now had eyes that were dull and, and non-responsive. And so Kirby eventually developed a talent where he could set up noise-making targets, and he could land a shot on these noise-making targets, and every so often, about 50% of the time, he would miss. But when he landed a shot, it was impressive enough to draw a small crowd. And then a reporter came to Kirby, and he said, Hey, Kirby, I, I know that you... You took great pride in your weapons, and you kept them all clean, and they were all immaculate. And even though you can't see that musket now, it's pretty beat up. 
And I know that in times past, she would have either fixed it, cleaned it up, or got a new one. And Kirby says, yeah, I still got that same old musket. And the guy says, why so? He says, well, because it will be just that more sweeter when I get a new one. So I'll carry this around for now. And then the reporter says, well, hey, Kirby, I knew you were a great man of faith until this happened. Kirby says, I'm, I'm still a man of faith. And he says, well, what about when the accident happened with your eyes? Did you pray? He says, yes, I prayed that God would heal my eyes. And he said, well, Kirby, that was five years ago. Don't look like no healing's coming for those eyes. And Kirby says, yeah, I, I kind of figured that. And he says, so what are you going to do about that? He said, nothing. I'll just keep these eyes now because it'll be that much more sweeter when I get my brand new ones in heaven. Kirby had every right to be depressed. He had every reason to be down. He had every reason to give up. But his faith, his knowing, staying faith in the fact of the resurrection gave him hope that regardless of his present situation, that one day the trumpet will sound, according to Scripture, will be raised with Jesus and be made brand new. And my prayer is that that's your faith today. Let's pray.